All right, I'm very excited about our next speaker. Ruman Chowdhury is the lead for Responsible AI at Accenture, and she's also a really powerful and important voice um, around AI ethics and justice. I'm sure many of you have seen her on social media or read interviews or her articles. Um, here's Ruman. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. I, I always like short intros because I get super embarrassed at long ones. All right, can you all hear me okay? Or Okay, perfect. Um, so I'm doing a talk today that's a little bit new. I, I've, you know, it's something I've increasingly been interested in. Just to give you a bit of background, I just did a month um, residency with the Rockefeller Foundation to really think through some of the issues. I, and I, I really genuinely think the surveillance state is probably the biggest issue that's not being enough talked about. And I realize at this conference, a lot of people have mentioned it. But if you look at the media, um, a lot of the conversation, it's really not quite at the at, at the level that at least I wish it were. There's a lot of talk about facial recognition. But what I want to emphasize today is that surveillance state is more than just facial recognition. Um, it is an ecosystem of technologies and data that's used together. Um, and I apologize if someone's, someone else has already said that, but it's, um, uh, you know, as much as I love all the focus on facial recognition, sometimes I feel like it distracts from a larger conversation. Or my concern actually is that we will be successful in having a moratorium or ban on facial recognition, and people will kind of think we're done when we're not. So the purpose of my talk, so kind of, I like to start with a bit of a TLDR. So if you like stop listening after this, yeah, I will be sad, but at least you'll <laughs> at least you'll get the point. Um, so what I want to talk about is this narrative about smart cities um, and all this tech that enables, quote, safety and security. So when you look at the notion of smart cities, the value proposition is always one of safety and security, right? We're going to um, catch the bad guys. Um, we're going to find terrorists. We're going to find missing children, lost pets, people stealing packages, right? It, and it's a narrative of fear. Um, and that's really what drives the creation of a surveillance. It's immediately setting your mindset of exclusion because guess what? If I'm making a narrative of we're going to catch the bad guy, somebody has to be the bad guy. There has to automatically be an other. And that other actually ends up getting defined by the people in power. That other isn't defined by you and me, it's defined by the police, it's defined by the military, it's defined by the companies and organizations that create, build, and sell these technologies. They're the ones creating the stories, not us. Um, they feed into narratives. Um, so what I'd like to do is deconstruct that notion, deconstruct that value proposition of safety and security and start from a brand new one. What if a smart city was a function of digital urban planning? So think about urban design, urban planning, which is you know, a, a very robust field that exists and I really love in the previous talk how there was talk about how policy impacts urban design. Um, and this is another example of it. So what if we reimagine these technologies as a part of urban design and specifically with the intent of merging our digital and analog selves? So most people in this room um, and basically anybody who's on the internet at this point, uh, this was really a revolution started by social media once we started using our real names instead of avata avatars and fake names, right? Our, our online selves and our analog selves really are merging. And it's happened, it's not, it hasn't really happened in the physical space like personally I will tell you you know I meet people actually just met Tawana today but we hugged like we're old friends but we've only known each other from Twitter and that is like my general existence <laughs> I travel a lot I'm like oh my god I know you we both like you know fan girl guy over each other for a bit and then I'm like you know so like but what, what does that look like so very tangibly what does that look like in the physical space there's so much we do online and there's so much more that can be enhanced about our physical existence so what might that look like so the structure of this will probably be about me talking for about half hour, um, and then we're gonna we're gonna do workshops. You've seen there's like six, one, two, three, four, five, five easel, six easel set up, and we're gonna do a bit of a workshop, and I'll frame it for you. Um, and actually, just want to let you know that I'm I'm gonna use the output of this workshop. Next Wednesday, um, I will be in Barcelona at a Smart City Summit, um, and it's actually a really important summit. So it's um, if you are following sort of the Smart Cities narrative, Barcelona is supposed to be the the place that's quote doing it right, um, that's trying to not make a surveillance state, that's trying to get citizen input and in design and creation. They really pride themselves on an ethical smart city. Um, and I looked at the other people presenting, and you know, literally no one is talking about surveillance state economies uh, so, and the surveillance state in general. 
So what I want to do is actually present the output of the workshop from here um, Wednesday. And in attendance will be the mayor of Barcelona, some folks from the European Commission. So like your input will actually be heard by people making big decisions. No, no pressure. No pressure. Well, you, you all are a super smart bunch. I'm not even, I'm not even a little bit worried. I'm not even a little bit worried. Um, I think it'll be great. So just to kind of, you know, just so a bit of framing. Um, as I mentioned, the surveillance ecosystem is more than just facial recognition. Um, and specifically, given my background as a political scientist, what I see when I, when I look at what's happening with smart cities is um, private or foreign actors controlling the civic digital backbone. So this is actually an example of political, economic, and regulatory capture, right? So it's privatizing the data infrastructure. And this is, not again, not just face recognition. It's cloud-based data systems, online monitoring tools, financial software, and government services, right? So we think about the move to digitize government services. What that actually means is that all of our personal and private information will be housed and stored, and we will have to trust a private third-party company to do it, right? This is a Google, this is an Amazon, this is a, you know. So for example, um, at the, the federal level, we have Amazon winning Project Jedi, which is a $10 billion national security contract. Again, putting on my political science hat, this is, not, this is actually not a, not a new story. Um, what happens is that leads to uh, to regulatory capture. So we have half, half the political candidates running for president saying we want to trust bust. We have a lot of support for trust busting. And we now have one company that holds all of our national security data. You tell me what that leads to when people want to start trust busting major companies, right? It doesn't, that doesn't actually end up happening because at least in this country, the national security narrative is one that beats any narrative, unfortunately or unfortunately, depending on your, on your perspective. Another thing I want to emphasize is that any digitization creates data. Um, so part of this surveillance ecosystem is not just the technology, but it is the data. And simply by having this technology, once you have measured something, it exists. Um, and I'm going to talk of, about a few examples that seem very innocuous, seemingly innocuous data collection that is actually quite impactful on people's lives. So one thing to think about when we think of a surveillance ecosystem, again, beyond the obvious things like our biometrics, even seemingly simple things, um, Create any measurement, any creation of data is something that really needs to be thought about from a safety and from a safety perspective of our information being stored, but also in the ability to use it in all in all these different ways that we didn't think about before. And just to illustrate the value proposition, I'm going to try to make this work. Just to illustrate the value proposition, this is an example. You probably have seen this. Oh, but there is no volume, is there? Um, all right, hold on. Sorry, one second. It's official. You can't eat wheat bread. Someone's been stealing packages. They call them porch pirates. Porch pirates. My son bought a snake on the dark web. It's a python. Five years, robots will be able to do your job, your job, your job, your job, your job, your job. Your job. Are you listening? Always, Denise. We are always <laughs> in a world full of fear. Someone has been sending packages. Simply safe. Oh. Your home should be anything but. Because home is a place you should simply <laughs> feel safe. So this was a Super Bowl ad. Um, yeah, this was a Super Bowl ad for Simply Safe, and this is this is the narrative that's being fed to the public. It's also the narrative that's you know obviously being fed to governments. Oh, and that's still going. Sorry, I don't know how to. Let me just. I'm just. Gonna, I'm just gonna mute that. All right. Sorry, Mindy. It's gonna keep running in the background. <laughs> Uh, for all that, so you know, I always hate putting movies, but that one was just so good I couldn't not put it in, and I always regret putting in a movie after I do. Now I can't find the mouse. There we are. All right, let's see if I can get back to this. Perfect. Okay. Um, so, like, so as I mentioned, you know, that's the narrative that's being told to the public. I mean, Amazon's doing the same thing with Ring Doorbell by introducing their uh, their I think it's called Neighborhood or Neighbor uh, cap uh, functionality, which is pretty much Neighborhood Watch. Um, and you know, if this is a narrative going to the public, we also realize a narrative that's going to governments and government leaders, right? 
So as I mentioned, this is the problem with the safety and security narrative. There has to be an other, there has to be an enemy, there has to be something you're looking for, someone or something bad, a quote, gut instinct that you're following. Um, and anybody who studies, or you know, if you even remotely follow any of the, any of the research about this kind of thing, um, you'll know that this ends up being divided on class and race lines. This is not, you know, it's usually not based on anything substantial. Um, it's usually not helpful, and actually just often leads to um, exclusionary outcomes. Um, so, and, and also, as I mentioned, the enemy is decided not by us, but often by law enforcement or the military. military. And what happens as we privatize these services, right, and we remove them from policymakers into the hands of um, the police, these are groups that are not citizen accountable. So the issue isn't um, creating a smart city that is owned by the government, it's also who owns it in the government, right? So if, if it's elected officials, if it's uh, parts of the government that are more transparent and able to be impacted, that's totally different from saying it's the military, it's the police that run this. And as I said, as a political scientist, what I think about is the regulatory and political capture. So these are the three big things that I think about when I think about what the, the negative outcomes of a surveillance state narrative based on the value proposition of safety and security. Um, so number one, it's the privatization of our civic digital infrastructure, right? So again, private companies owning data that's quite sensitive. And just to give you an example, um, you know, there was a bio, there was I think a fingerprint leak um, in uh, in one of the one of the uh, police state um, the police bodies in the UK I forget who it may have been in Leeds but you think about it you know it's one thing when there's a password leak right you can change your password but you cannot change your biometrics so as we are forced to we don't get a choice as we are forced to give this information and it's being stored by third party organizations that may not actually store it in a secure manner we have no agency or ownership over what happens to this information if it's stolen. Um, Second, it's the hidden militar militarization of our streets. So from a political philosophy perspective, I think about the rule of law, right, and what makes a society function. Societies do not function because we are genuinely afraid that the police will catch us and give us a ticket or throw us in jail if we have a minor infraction. There's a ton of literature that talks about how, you know, what makes society work as a social contract. We have all agreed to be good people to each other. And it sounds kind of Pollyanna and it's a little bit naive, but it's actually true. Um, and the, the best example I like to give, again, the person who travels a ton, but no matter where you go in the world, more or less, there is always a rule when you go up an escalator, right? You stand on the right and you walk on the left. Right? Everyone's nodding. We've all seen this. And we've seen it in every single city. It is not police enforceable. No one's going to give you a ticket. Yeah, someone will be like, hey, move over or something. It is enforced by the crowd. It's on a law. No one ever said it was. And yet here we are because we've all agreed that this is the best way for all of us to exit wherever we are exiting. It's usually public transit or an airport, right? How, how did we come to that point, right? Uh, but who, who decided that? Especially if there's no punishment. There technically isn't real punishment if you don't adhere to it. So this militarization, I actually worry, erodes the social fabric of society. Um, and, you know, and we see it in places that are low trust societies. Low trust societies actually tend to have more militarization because people, people do not trust in each other to take care of, of the rest of the, the environment around them. I'm not saying it's an easy thing to do, um, but I worry that this militarization will actually uh, will actually erode the trust that we have in each other. So this hidden militarization, and the reason why it's more, quote, acceptable is because it's hidden, right? If someone decided, hey, there's going to be a cop on every corner holding a machine gun, um, people would not be okay, and yet we're going to say we're going to have cameras directly linked to the police on everyone's doorbell, at least if Amazon had its way. Um, so the fact that you can't see or that it's so small um, is really part of part of the thing that's worrying. And then finally, really what we're doing is we're digitizing existing tensions. So part of my research in the, in the month I spent at Bellagio was looking at the narratives in different cities and the different resistance movements. And I will tell you, the one thing I will say um, is that the resistance movements behind the smart cities and surveillance state narratives are really beautiful to see. Some really brilliant, amazing people all around the world coming at this from a policy perspective, a legal perspective, a community organization perspective. It's, it's kind of amazing to see. 
But one thing I see over and over again is these aren't new stories that are being introduced. It is the digitization of existing tensions and it's shifting the power towards the oppressor. So when we look at Los Angeles, this has always been about the LAPD versus the, the, uh, the black and Hispanic community. That's what it's always been. And this is just a new iteration of it, right? Rodney King was so long ago and th like the, the new um, Pred Paul, et cetera, that's being used in LA, predictive policing, is simply a new iteration of that. In San Diego, it's been about, quote, illegal immigrants, right? So how do we secure the border? This is, again, not a new story. In Detroit, it's about tensions between the police and the, and the black and brown communities. In New York, it's, it's about the police and the Muslim communities and sex workers. Um, so no matter where you go in the world, it's actually the stories that have existed. Um, but these tensions are being digitized. And again, the power is being shifted often to the oppressors, often to the people with more power and more of a voice. Um, so a couple of really, so just to give you a few examples of how we're seeing this happen. The privatization of a digital inf uh, civic infrastructure. So Jason Sadowski is someone, someone amazing to follow. On Twitter, he also has uh, a really good article, and that's what this links to in real life. Um, and this is a really wonderful quote from there. And he actually has a book coming out pretty soon. The smart city is not a coherent concept, let alone an actually existing entity. It's better understood as a misleading euphemism for a corporately controlled urban future. I think Sidewalk Labs has been sort of the best example of how we've seen that happen. Um, but just to give you an, an example that is not Sidewalk Labs, um, a joint venture between the NYPD and Microsoft, um, there was, a, there was a, an actual system of, uh, quote, surveillance, um, that's the largest network of cameras, license plate readers, and radiological sensors in the world at the time that quote was pulled. And again, this is Microsoft and the NYPD working together. So to think a little bit about hidden militarization, so um, ICE seeks as access to license plate scanners actually happened in the city of San Francisco. And this is to the point, this, and I use this point to talk about how some of this is very innocuous seeming technology, innocuous seeming data. So the original intent of creating license plate scanners was to make it easier and more efficient for traffic cops to identify um, individuals if they've overstayed how long they're allowed to park somewhere. So instead of them you know, blocking traffic, standing in the way, writing a ticket, da da da, it like, automatically scans license plates, you know, it uses optical character recognition, digitizes, and literally will like mail you a ticket. Um, there's a lot to be said about punitive policing, <laughs> right? Um, but again, I think a lot of people would say, wow, great, totally efficient. I don't see how that could be harmful, except as I said, uh, digitizing anything creates data. So now you have license plate numbers of um, both license plates that were, you know, both uh, compliant and non-compliant, and you have timestamps. Um, and ICE wants access to this so they can track people who are suspicious. Um, so, so, and it's not just that, right? So we have law enforcement using stingrays, which are a tracking device that mimics cell phone towers. This goes back many years. This is not a new story. Um, but you can merge this all together. So again, this is the surveillance ecosystem. So it's something like license plate scanners, stingrays, um, you know, technology that already exists. This is not about fancy new tracking technology. It's actually piecing together a narrative of where someone is and where someone has been, um, and creating this ability to pretty much rewind time and follow any person no matter where they are, in public and often in private. And this is hidden, it's completely hidden to us because it's not like someone's physically following you. And much like a narrative on privacy, and I think any privacy lawyer or tech privacy person will tell you, it's really hard to get people to understand privacy erosion. This is another thing it's hard to get people to understand because it's hard to see um, until it actually is you that is the recipient of all this. Um, and then finally thinking through digitizing existing tensions, um, so, and I mentioned a few examples earlier, but we have Compton, Philly, and Baltimore using the types of aerial surveillance technologies that are actually used in Iraq and Iran um, to, to police uh, the population that are, you know, the population that they're seeking to oppress. And I want to actually add another angle to this. So this, I've just been talking about the US, but this is a global story. Um, and some of you have probably seen either my talk on algorithmic colonialism or you know, the thing I was passing around with some of the reading materials. So I do want to build it into this story because it is really important. Um, so algorithmic, so what, once we've taken this technology out of a Western or a Chinese context, there is a colonization aspect to this. Um, or a recolonization aspect to this. Um, in, in particular, I look at African nations in a way that's actually quite worrying. Um, a lot, all of this technology comes from China, almost entirely, although the US has been very, um, 
particularly Google, has been quite involved in laying out some of the internet infrastructure. Um, but pretty much China has been, been the dominant country in laying out a lot of the surveillance state technology. And just to give you an example, um, here are a few images of you know either literally surveillance projects that Huawei specifically is uh, is performing uh, all around all around the continent, or specifically offices and network projects. So laying down 4G and 5G. So how, why does that matter and how does that matter? So again, we have a, a foreign entity coming in, creating the civic digital infrastructure of another country and other people. And they are now extracting, you know, as much as I think everyone gets tired of hearing data is the new oil, they are now actually extracting data and information from individuals who have not consented. But again, this is not like your government doing it to you. It is now a foreign entity doing it to a place where people have been exploited um, for many centuries. And this is just a new form of exploitation. Um, and to, to think through specifically the kinds of impact it has, so it has actually a chilling effect on democracy. So what, what we actually saw happen was Huawei engineers uh, working with the Ugandan government to, to monitor, and this, this guy is Bobby Wine, who's an opposition candidate for presidency, who returned to Uganda for foreign support. And there's a lot of controversy around him, but the point is the existing Ugandan government asked, and, and actually, and Huawei helped them, um, monitor Wine, Bobby Wine's WhatsApp group. Um, under a 2010 law that gave the government the ability to, quote, secure its multidimensional interests, which is very, very broad. Um, uh, in Zambia, Huawei technicians um, helped the government access phones and Facebook pages of the opposition party. So again, chilling effect on democracy as the individuals who are working with these private external corporations uh, ask and receive the kind, kind of help to help them cement um, uh, autocratic regimes. Um, and so actually, there was this really great paper that came out, a really great report from the Carnegie Endowment. And I suggest if you are at all interested in surveillance state, uh, the, uh, or the rise of, the, of AI surveillance around the world to read this report. I mean, I think it came out towards the end of my residency, towards the end, end of October. Um, and just reading the executive summary, I felt like the person who wrote it was kind of screaming. Uh, he was, it, it, it's, it's bad. <laughs> you know, he was like, you know, being very measured. He's like, I work for Carnegie. I'm going to write this like very professional sounding thing. But I genuinely felt like he was like shaking the reader and being like, you guys need to freaking listen to what's going on. Um, so if we look at the origins of technology, it's pretty much all coming from the US or from China, but predominantly from China. Um, and this is not by mistake. And what I do want to point out is the narrative often becomes that of, oh, hey, look at what the Chinese are doing to, uh, in, to the Uyghur population. Look at what's happening um, in Israel. Look at, we're, we want to point out these very clear-cut cases of oppression. Um, but I do want to point out that at least 75 of the 176 countries globally are using AI technologies for surveillance purposes, and 51% of them, 51% uh, of advanced democracies are using them. So we are not talking about, it's actually fewer autocratic regimes are using them than advanced democracies are what, what you know, in the Carnegie classification they'd classify that, uh, classify as. So this is not a narrative of us versus them, like we are the healthy functioning democracy and oh look at the bad people who will continue to oppress it. It's actually us. Um, so before we point fingers at other countries, I think it's really worthwhile to think about how we are using it. Um, so that kind of drives the imperative of what I'm calling digital urban design. Um, so the, the, whole, the whole point of this first half was not the fear mongering, but just to illustrate how we start from this value proposition that seems good, right? Safety and security, who doesn't want to be safe and secure? But it does snowball and it does spiral because of how it's been set up. And, and I'm a strong believer in you know, the origination of things and how that impacts what it becomes downstream. So I want to reimagine what a smart city is, what this, what this technology could be used for as, as digital urban design. And I want to start with a quote from Ruha Benjamin, who I think we all love. Um, and I messaged her. So I, I know everyone, everyone usually uh, talks about race after technology. But actually, captivating technology is my personal favorite. And I messaged her after I read it. And I'm like, you know, I read a lot of these books. Um, and this was the first one I've read that was imaginative. She clearly loves science fiction. She clearly, like, she, she, has, a, she has a flair for, the, for fiction writing as well as nonfiction writing. Um, and I wanted to actually start off by thinking about this quote. 
The task then is to challenge not only forms of discriminatory design in our inner and outer lives, but to work with others to imagine and create alternatives to the techno quo, business as usual when it comes to techno science, as part of a larger struggle to materialize collective freedoms and flourishing. Um, and there are a lot of movements out there to move beyond these narratives of, let's say, efficiency, safety, security, which are basically like bottom tier, to really be more ambitious and think about human flourishing, human freedom. Um, and, and I thought this was a really perfect quote to kind of kick off um, you know, how we're going to start the workshop. So I'm going to pose a series of kind of high-level what-if questions. Um, feel free to take them in whatever way you want. So this slide, I'm going to give some high-level questions. The next slide, I'll give some more specific questions if you're really just stuck. But you know, you're not limited by what I'm framing here. Um, so what if the purpose of smart cities and smart homes was to enable our digital and analog existences to merge? What if digital urban design was the value proposition? What if technology measured things and not people? And to, I guess, some more specific questions. Oops, sorry. Um, what are some physical touch points in an analog space that could be a representation of the digital, right? So one idea I like to throw out there is, what if your library was Google? What would that look like? What does that mean? Um, what are meaningful ways citizens can use existing technology to be engaged in planning? So much of this, and again, I, I like the second question because this is how Barcelona is trying to approach the smart city design. They actually have a platform that they use where people can vote. Um, but you know, there's a lot to be said about having a town hall style vote, tyranny of the majority, et cetera. But so what are meaningful ways that we can even get marginalized and smaller groups to be engaged in this planning in a way that speaks to them and is not about them going out of their way to help others, right? And then I do want to bring in policymakers. So how can policymakers creatively capture public sentiment in the early stages of digital urban design? So if you talk to any policymaker in this space, they're actually stuck themselves. Um, they really want to know what people want, and they get mixed reception. Some people love the idea of, of uh, having a ring doorbell, and oh god, don't you hate when the neighbor's kids, blah, blah, blah. Other people like us are very vocal about it. I'll give you, actually, I'll give you an example. My apartment sent out an email saying that we're, uh, we're just all going to transition to smart electronics in the home, as well as a smart doorbell. I think I'm actually the only person that said anything that, that's deciding to opt out. What I'm actually worried about is if I opt out of some of this stuff, which includes like a CO2 monitor, et cetera, if anything happens in my apartment, I will be held liable. Right. So, like, so what are the meaningful ways we can opt out? Um, which is actually kind of the last question. But also, when people are creating these policies, or even my apartment building, trying to install, you know, install these technologies, um, how can they creatively capture public sentiment? Because my apartment building didn't do that. They just assumed everybody wanted it. That it would be, a, it would be a plus and a bonus. Um, and then finally, in the U.S., we don't have a right to not be found. But even even in even under GDPR, if you're in Europe, how are you going to create a smart city and give everybody the right to not be found? What does that mean? What does that look like? And how do you meaningfully opt out? Thinking through the example I just gave about not wanting this technology in my apartment, but then being worried about any potential liability that might carry if, say, my apartment got flooded or there was a fire or something happened. All right, so I'm going to stop talking. 2.32, so we have a half an hour. Um, I think you guys are already split up into groups. If you don't have an easel near you, come find somebody. I'll leave it on these questions so you guys have something to look at. But again, you're not limited to these, um, whatever you'd like. And if you have any questions, um, I guess I'll be walking around or I'll come by. Great, thank you.